John is in a vision taken into the heavenly throne room. Here he watches as a lamb breaks the seals of a book, a scroll that has been presented to him in heaven. Welcome to another tidbit from the book of Revelation. We are moving into chapter 6. But chapter 6, though it seems to be a new beginning with new scenes, is a continuation of the previous chapter. In that chapter, we saw how Jesus is regarded as worthy to open a scroll, a mystical scroll that is na named in the book of Revelation itself in 13.8 as the book of life. Jesus is regarded as worthy, he is crowned as a king, he is praised as a lamb together with God on his throne. Now we continue. The scene in chapter 5 is a close parallel to the judgment scene in Daniel 7. So close that they must be identical. It is often uh, claimed that that cannot be the case because there is little judgment language in chapter 5 in the book of Revelation. However, that will come in the book of Daniel. Jesus is first in the figure of the Son of Man, crowned as king, and then judgment is proclaimed in favor of the saints. Now that will come later in the book of Revelation, and let's remember the close connection. Thinking about it this way, when you read, it will take you some minutes to read through the first scenes of chapter 6 where four writers are shown riding throughout the earth. To write it down would have taken even longer maybe from John, but actually to see the scenes would have taken probably only 20 seconds. These scenes are still part of what is going on, what is shown to him in heaven. But what it opens for is the constant shift between heaven and earth that we see in the book of Revelation. He is in heaven, but he sees scenes on earth. And then he moves back and forth. That is one of the secrets of understanding Revelation. In the book, John is taken in behind the scenes of the confusing earthly history. And by watching and taking part in the heavenly worship, he comes to understand that God is un in control. So to the four writers. They're difficult to understand. And I'm not going to give any historical overview, but I want to point out a motif of these chapters 6 and 7 that belong together. That is a motif of war. The four writers represent the progress, if you can call it progress, of war. First you have a writer where it's all victorious. Messages are brought home about the victory of the army. But then, if you look at the second horse that is described in verse 3 and 4, then it is death. Soldiers are brought home in caskets. And as war continues, we move into a time where there is scarcity of food, rationing. And as it continues with the fourth writer, we see epidemics, sickness. Now this is what happens in times of war. What begins with the appearance of victory and all the good things that you can imagine when you win will be destroyed as you go on and it will end in disaster. If you think of the First World War, the Great War to end of war, all wars, it ended with one of the most disastrous epidemics, the Spanish flu, that the world has seen. Now, this war motif is continued as we move on, but let me point out one other aspect. When you read, it was said 
about the first rider who has a bow and a crown was given to him. He came out conquering and to conquer. Notice the expression, it was given to him, it was given. This is an expression you can find uh, several times and the several, same expression you find in Daniel 7 about the beast from the sea, they were given. What does that mean? They were given power. It means that behind all this, God is still in control. That is a word of comfort to the saints in this situation. Now, these scenes are shown as the Lamb is breaking the seals, but don't misunderstand it. These scenes are not in themselves the content of the book. The book can only be read when all the seven seals have been broken. But they are obviously scenes that the heavenly tribunal finds important and significant to see as a background for the final justification of the saints, which will come a little later. After the four riders, you have a kind of different event shown. When the Lamb is breaking the fifth seal of the book, we read in verses 9 and onwards, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. So this is a representation of the martyrs. And they are crying, they are shouting, they are offering a prayer. That means that some would say the altar could be the altar of incense, most likely in the most holy. That prayer is a cry for justice. O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood? The judgment is not seen as a revenge in a negative sense. But judgment here is in a civil case. The saints cannot be justified fully before the accuser has been thrown down. That event will happen later in the book of Revelation. The answer to the question will be taken up in the following chapter. So we will wait to chapter 7 and titbits from chapter 7 to look at that. But then the war motif is recurring. There will be signs in heaven, the seventh seal is broken, signs in heaven, the heaven is rolled together as a scroll and the mountains and everything is shaking and people become afraid. And as we read, we find a paradox. The kings of the earth, as we read in verse 15, and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone slave and free hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Here's a paradox. They are awaiting for the divine warrior to arrive. The scene here is described as what is called in theological language a theophany, the appearance of God. God is on his way. Many texts in the Old Testament describe God in civil, similar, uh, with similar phrases. And then they are afraid of the wrath of the Lamb. I don't know what you know about sheep and lambs. But if there's one animal of which I'm not really afraid, it is a lamb. The lamb is a victor. Here's a paradox. The war motif is permeating all of the book of Revelation, but the way God has been winning his war is different from what we normally expect. The book of Revelation, in, in all its grotesque language, is actually a book for pacifists. The Lamb has won his war by dying on a cross. Why would you be afraid of such a saviour? 
the last sentence in the book, or sorry, not in the book, but in the chapter, says, For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? And that particular question answered, is answered in the following chapter. But it also points to a scenic aspect, because as the earth has been shaken, heavens have been shaking, there's no place to stand. So where can you stand? Who can stand? That double question is the focus of the following chapter. So welcome back to Titbit from Revelation chapter 7. That will be for next time. Thank you for listening.